dining while keeping our distance. Joining us on Columbus on the record this week, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News, and Kathy Kambisky, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Well, we are still zooming here on Columbus on the record. No need to mute yourselves. This is a not that type of Zoom meeting, but anyway, we hope to get back to normal soon. This is Memorial Day weekend, and Ohio is kind of back to normal. It's the new normal. Campgrounds are open. We can travel to Indiana now and not have to stay home for two weeks when we get back. We can go shopping. We could actually go out to eat. Well, but it is the new normal, as we said. We must stay apart even as we gather together. Staying six feet apart in a bar or restaurant is difficult. This past week, a few bar owners looked the other way as patrons and customers crowded shoulder to shoulder on patios. Governor DeWine said crowding is not to continue if Ohio is to beat the coronavirus. He has formed a special enforcement team that will watch for bars to make sure they keep their customers apart. They will surge in uh, to conduct safety compliance checks uh, in crowded bars and restaurants. Uh, they will issue, they will issue administrative citations that can result in the revocation of liquor licenses. Further, uh, they will work with municipal, municipal prosecutors to take potential criminal action against these bad actors. This weekend, those rules apply to bars and restaurants on the inside as well as the patios, which is good because it's going to rain this weekend, it looks like. Laura Bischoff, um, if you remember way back in March, one of the reasons why the governor closed down bars and restaurants is because it was right before St. Patrick's Day. And he was afraid that people would pack into these bars to celebrate St. Patrick's Day and that the virus would spread. He seems serious about really enforcing this order to make sure that that doesn't happen now in the middle of May. Yeah, you know, it's not surprising at all that, um, you know, the first one of the first nice weekends that we had uh, in mid-May and the patios were open. And of course, you know, the, a lot of the patios that I saw were following the rules and they were had just a few parties on the out, out enjoying drinks or, or meals. Um, but it's not surprising that some would go ahead and pack it in. And I think that there's a risk that that might happen again over the long holiday weekend. Um, and, you know, even though the governor's moving forward with these openings, he still has a lot of reservations and continues to say, like, the virus is still with us. It's still here. And that social distancing and wearing masks are the are the real big tools that we can use. And so he's still imploring people to, to be responsible about how they behave in public. Kathy Kabisky, could he make it easier by saying, okay, you can open it as a restaurant or a bar, but limit your capacity to 50% or 30% of your normal capacity. Put a number on it. The regulations don't do that. They have to sort I of think Follow I think the, the governor's, I'm sorry, I think the governor's hesitant to put specifications on. I think they want people to kind of police themselves and monitor. And there's a lot at stake. I mean, social distancing has been shown to slow the spread of the virus. As the governor opens up these restaurants, you know, the economy in general, businesses, there's a real risk that this is going to spread. And what most people, restaurant owners, bar owners, and everyone don't want to see again is to have closures, then have to close everything up one more time would be a disaster. Laura's self-regulation, can that work? You know, I think it really depends on the population. There's, there's, a, there's a good swath of um, Ohioans who really feel resentful of the orders. They feel like it's a government overreach and um, that it's impinging on their personal freedoms. Um, there's other, you know, chunks of the population that really are, very much afraid of, of contracting the virus because they have underlying conditions so that um, an infection could be very serious for them or for their loved ones. So I think it's kind of a mixed bag, actually. How, how is this enforcement going to work? He said they were looking at maybe 70 people, more people, a combination of state inspectors, you know, liquor control agents, some local folks, Board of Health folks. Obviously, 70, even 100 people couldn't patrol every bar in Ohio, every restaurant in Ohio. So what is it going to look like? Are they going to wait for a complaint or are they going to do spot checks? I think you're going to see all of that. I think in Columbus, for instance, two bars got cited the first weekend, first day. Um, 
both were referred to the city pro city attorney's office, Zach Klein, who has a policy of education first, citation second. So I think they're going to be doing a lot of warnings. I'm sure enforcement's going to vary a lot county to county. Laura, any like when you what we've if you're a restaurant and you have a capacity that's dictated by the fire marshal and a fire marshal walks in or a police officer walks in and sees that you're considerably over that capacity, he can say, kick these people out or, or shut down. Will they, will it come to that? Well, that remains to be seen. I think that um, like Kathy says, some of the jurisdictions will be taking kind of like an educate, educate first, give them a warning. Um, you know, I think that there are some venues that will get multiple visits in the same evening. Um, you know, re re really, we'll have to see. I think it, the the ones that are really egregious, where they have you know hundreds of people packed together, um, they're gonna they're gonna be take they're gonna get a more serious sanction. Yeah, and if if Friday night, last Friday night, last week uh, was any indication, especially with the outdoor patios, it didn't take long for it to light up on social media which bars right. were adhering to this and which bars were not. So if all that team really needs to do is monitor Twitter, it seems. They could probably get we, on. We get a lot of calls to the newsroom as well, telling us about offenders. I'm sure Laura does as well. Yeah. So that like brings me to my next point. You know, we one of our reporters, Nick Evans, went to a restaurant in Grandview Heights this week, the first day the restaurants were open on Thursday, and it was it was largely empty. Popular lunch spot, usually packed. It was pretty empty because people were still cautious, not quite ready to go out yet. And if a restaurant's not adhering to the rules, that's going to make folks even more cautious. So there's an incentive, correct? Absolutely. And, you know, when you think about it, um, you know, a, a pretty substantial number of people have underlying conditions that put them at higher risk. Um, obesity is like 32% in Ohio. Smoking is 22, 24%, something like that. Um, asthma, diabetes, heart conditions, etc. And so there's, there are a lot of people that are, are, you know, very concerned. And although, you know, people are anxious, they want to get out, they want to have fun, they want to go socialize. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to reconcile that with the fact that the virus is still active and only like what, two and a half percent of Ohioans have been tested for it so far. Yeah, that, that brings me to my next topic, is the status of testing. There, Kathy, there is, Governor DeWine touts the capacity of the test is up close to 20 now tests a day. We, Ohio has the capacity to do that, but we're not testing that many. We're not testing really close to that many, right? Last figure I saw was eight or 9,000, correct me if it's changed since uh, a couple no, of years. No, and it's not clear to me why we're not testing more than that. I mean, there's certainly recommendations in nursing homes to test 100% of the residents there. There's certainly recommendations for prisons and other hotspots, but it's not happening. And I, I would have to say, I'm not really sure how you get tested. I mean, I've checked with my own doctor's office and been told that I can't get tested. Yeah, I think you have to be showing symptoms. Even I think the OSU Medical Center was bringing testing into some uh, some inner city neighborhoods, mainly where African American folks live, who are obviously affected disproportionately by this virus. And those folks didn't need a doctor's order, but they had to be showing symptoms. So if you're asymptomatic, if you're not showing symptoms, you you, you couldn't even get tested there. And of course, the problem is you're asymptomatic, and you can still be spreading the disease and not know it. Yeah. Is that a sore spot, Laura, for the governor and the testing? Is there a frustration on the state level that we're that they're, after all these weeks, nine, 10 weeks into this, we're still at only two, two and a half percent of Ohioans have been tested? We really don't know how, how much this is spread around the state. Right. Well, I think that a lot of people who were showing some sort of symptoms maybe back in you know, March and they wanted to get tested, but they didn't meet that criteria because the, the PPE, the uh, personal protective equipment was so limited and the testing was so limited. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if as they roll out antibody testing to see if the folks who had symptoms then but didn't get a test if they actually had COVID and have have uh, recovered. Um, I think that it's unclear to me why they're not um, at the capacity of 20, 22,000, why they're not all the way up there. Um, there certainly there are outbreaks in nursing homes and, and prisons and they could be doing more testing. The DRC director Annette Chambers Smith told me this week that um, it doesn't make sense to do mass testing anymore because they thought that maybe the asymptomatic rate would be, you know, a much smaller percentage and they'd be able to easily separate the sick from the not sick. Uh, but then they quickly realized that it was just, it was like too hard and too much of a moving target. And the test gives you 
a picture, a snapshot and a picture in time. And just because somebody tests negative, maybe their viral load isn't high enough. And like three days later, while they're sitting in with all the well people, they've been infecting them and they develop symptoms, you know, four or five days after the test is administered. Yeah, and so, so many things we, we don't know what we don't know about this virus really. It, right. it, it, is a, it is a changing story. Like we heard today from the CDC that it can't be really spread that well on, on surfaces. And we've been disinfecting, you know, for <laughs> You know, wiping down every you know can of beer you get from the grocery store, and turns out maybe what's not, you didn't have to do all that. But anyway, uh, as uh, Laura mentioned, nursing homes and assisted living facilities appear to be taking the, uh, a big brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic in Ohio. Seventy percent of the deaths in Ohio due to COVID-19 are linked to nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Nursing homes, of course, are particularly vulnerable. Their residents mm -hmm. are the frailest and the oldest members of our community, and they live in close proximity. But critics mm -hmm. say the state was slow to conduct mass testing at nursing homes, and officials at the state have been less than fully transparent when it comes to releasing data on, on tests in, in nursing homes around the state. Kathy Kandiski, 70% of the deaths in Ohio connected to nursing homes. What should we make of that number? Oh, what we need to make in that number is it shows how vulnerable our senior citizens are to this disease and how probably most of our efforts to protect people from spread need to be focused on those folks in nursing homes. Um, I want to talk about the testing, though. The federal government has recommended that 100 percent of nursing home residents be tested, and Governor DeWine has said that's not going to happen here in Ohio because we don't have the tests. That raises the question of how are you going to reopen, which people are starting to talk about reopening nursing homes. People need to meet with their loved ones. This has been really hard on, on people in the nursing homes and their family outside the nursing homes. But if you're not able to test people, I don't know how you open the doors and let the people come in. Yeah, all these people, cases have been happening. That was one of the first things, Laura, that the governor shut down, no visitors to nursing homes. So this virus is getting in through other means, not family members primarily through staff or contractors or whomever is bringing the virus into the nursing home. Right, and they've had, they've had those limits um, and I think doing temperature checks and other things on staffers mm -hmm. and on, on visitors to the nursing home or vendors or contractors who come and go. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's um, once it gets into a congregate living center like a, a nursing home or a prison, it's very difficult to control um, and in nursing homes in particular, because those folks are so vulnerable and so medically fragile, it is it can just be devastating. In nursing home, critics have shown, they point to a federal study that shows that nursing homes really, even before this, were not doing enough to control infections. They weren't disinfecting enough or keeping people separate enough. So it only this only leads to more criticism of what is going on in the nursing homes. The data that's being released, it's slow, it's once a week, Sometimes we get the number of cases in each facility, but not the number of deaths. Why is the data so cumbersome coming from the state? Laura, do you know? What is the reason they give? I, uh, you know, it's it's really unclear to me. Maybe Kathy's got a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, critics would say they're trying to hide the true numbers. Um, I think I think there was some hesitancy at the beginning to release numbers because they didn't want to suggest that certain nursing homes were doing something wrong. I think I heard Dr. Acton say that at the very beginning. Um, but really, you got to err on the side of protecting people at this point, and people need to know what's going on in their nursing homes if, if people, you know, their loved ones are living there. I mean, how do you know if a nursing home is doing something right or wrong if we don't have the data? I mean, there, there's no right. evidence. It's just assuming everyone's fine, and if we release numbers that it would look bad. It would have, Especially now bad. with no one going into the nurse, without visitors going into the nursing homes. I mean, without families seeing firsthand what's going on. Nationally, the latest I saw, because the numbers have been they're quite varying. I think it was 81% of the deaths in Canada, for instance, are connected to nursing homes. Other states have 60% connected to nursing homes. But I think nationally, the average is about 30% of the deaths are connected to nursing homes. What do you make of the difference between where Ohio is at 70%, but the average is say 30 to 35% deaths in nursing homes? Do we make anything out of that number? I we have an older population perhaps, is, comes to mind. 
I, I also think it's it's difficult because Ohio um, hasn't been testing widespread in the general population, and but has been testing more in prisons and in nursing homes than in the general population, and so you know you're it, it, that's you're going to get a higher percentage in those could concrete it, settings. Could it also be that Ohio has been more aggressive, was more aggressive at the start in shutting things down? That that younger people who are less vulnerable to this disease have been isolating, so the death rate might be lower than it should than, than other states among people who do not live in nursing homes. Sounds be, good, perhaps. Could be. <laughs> I mean, I've seen some, I, you know, you have to be really careful. God knows you've got to be really careful what you read into, into Twitter. But the critics of the stay at home order are saying, I read this on social media, is that Look, it's sad that the folks in the nursing home are the most vulnerable and the most susceptible to the serious consequences of this disease. But the fact that the deaths are largely, 70% of the deaths are in nursing homes means that the rest of us are relatively safe. And that's a push for reopening uh, the state. What have state officials said about that at all? You hear that argument. Um... And I think the pushback you get from people on the other side of it is, again, going back to folks that are asymptomatic, spreading the disease without knowing it, and that's the reason, and that's justification for the shutdown. Not only that, but you know, a, a loved one is a loved one, and um, you know, people say like, oh well, you know, Annie Glenn, she lived to a hundred, and and COVID um, complications is what was attributed to her death. But she was an Ohio treasurer, and she, maybe she could have lived to 101 or 102, 105, whatever. And you know, until it's your uh, grandmother or your neighbor or your friend, um, you know, maybe it, it still matters to to other to other people who are family members. One other factor in this is the nursing home lobby in the state is significant. It's it's fairly powerful. How much of an influence does the Nursing Home Association have on policy making, the release of information, information, the release of data, the testing that goes on in the in nursing homes, Kathy? Is there any indication? They have a lot, they have, they historically have had a lot of influence in the legislature. Now, publicly, the nursing home lobby came out and said they favored releasing the information about what was going on in terms of deaths. They wanted the data released publicly. Um, that was their position. So on this on this issue, it sounded like they were willing to go along with it. Right. It begs the question if they're all okay with it, but maybe individual owners aren't, but you know, why aren't state state officials? Well, that's true. That's could true. be a different story behind the scenes. They were running ads early on. I don't know if they still are or not, but the nursing home association was running uh, ads saying, you know, they were with their residents and with their staff trying to protect them from COVID nineteen early on. I think. So, in this pandemic. I'm not sure if they're still running those ads. Anyway, something worth watching. Prisons have also been hard hit by the coronavirus. To date, 63 inmates have died of COVID-19 in Ohio, as well as four staff members at Ohio prisons. A federal prison in northeastern Ohio has also had big problems with coronavirus. Kathy Kandinsky, same situation. A lot of people in a confined space. Disease spreads very quickly. What is the state doing to try to stop the spread of COVID-19 in the prisons? The state is, is doing a lot. They, um, they've restricted visitors. They've um, reduced to two meals a day. They've tried to social distance as much as they can, which is very, very difficult. And I, some would say impossible in nursing homes. They did do some mass testing originally at a couple of the prisons that were um, having a lot of cases, specifically Marion and Pickaway. At one point, I think 80% of the uh, incarcerated population at those two prisons was infected. Um, those numbers have come down since. But so now they've discontinued the mass testing, as Laura mentioned earlier, and they're doing more spot testing and trying to focus more on treatment, treat, treating people that have medical, you know, that have, are showing symptoms and have medical needs. Um, but it's an uphill battle. I mean, they're now seeing a spike in cases at Belmont Correctional Institution in St. Clairsville and other outbreaks are expected as well in different facilities. Or what were the reasons they gave for, uh, for not doing the mass testing anymore in the prisons? 
Well, like I said, they, uh, the, the test it gives you a snapshot of what's going on with that patient at that particular time. So you may think that inmate Mike is, uh, has tested negative and he's good, but actually you just haven't developed enough of a viral load to, uh, to trigger a positive test. So meanwhile, you're in with all the healthy people and you are walking around asymptomatic and infecting more people. So it just became too much of a moving target. And keep in mind that in Ohio, 60% of the, of the uh, prisons have open bay housing. That means they're, they're in bunk beds that are like three feet apart, and they're not in the, 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 the prisons where it hasn't arrived yet, where they don't have any COVID cases, are like Lucasville and I think Ross Correctional, where they have cells and, and the inmates can be, you know, they can self-isolate. Yeah, I, I used to speak to inmates at the, at the pickaway facility. And I was amazed that there were open rooms with, you know, dozens of bunk beds. Just they, this room was not meant to house prisoners. But they were, as you said, they were like three feet apart, two, two bunks each, arms, arms, way, arms, uh, arms length away. So there's no way you could, if someone in that room got infected, it would spread like, spread like wildfire. Um, the, the federal prison has come under a lot of fire from, from lo lawsuits and really pressure to release prisons prisoners. The federal government has released some prisoners from its prisons, of course, notably Paul Manafort, some other, uh, Michael Cohen, President uh, Trump's former allies. Uh, releasing of Ohio prisoners has not happened a whole lot, correct? There have been about 2,000, I think, released so far, but prison advocates are saying that number needs to be a lot higher. I think the last number I heard was that the prisons were over capacity by about seven or 8,000 people. So I think that's more the number that the advocates are targeting. And yeah, I, I would also say that I think about a thousand of, of the ones are, like the, the head count has been reduced by about 2000, but about a thousand of that is just people who just weren't transferred from county jails to the state prisons. Um, in terms of pardons and early releases, it's been just you know several hundred, it hasn't been wide scale. Yeah, one of the many spotlights this virus is, is cast on is the is obviously the problem of prison overcrowding, which we've known about for a long time, but it's really right. evident here. Let's get to our last topic pretty briefly. It is hard enough to get on the a proposed ballot amendment onto the ballot here in Ohio. You have to collect hundreds of thousands of signatures, hard enough, and then you tell everybody to stay home. And if they do go outside, you got to stay six feet apart from each other. That's the problem that supporters of legal marijuana raising the minimum wage and changing Ohio's voting laws faced as they tried to gather signatures and meet a July 1st deadline. It was going to be nearly impossible. They went to court. This week, a federal judge gave them some leeway. He extended the deadline to the end of July and also said they can collect electronic signatures. Laura, is this going to be enough, do you think, to get these folks onto the ballot or is it still going to be uh, tough? Well, first off, I think it's still a big heavy lift to get all those signatures, but also I anticipate that there will be an appeal. Uh, I think I saw something from the Ohio Republican Party that said, you know, the, the signatures must be in ink. This electronic signature um, method is not allowable. So it could be tied up in court for a while. Yeah, Michigan court, appeals court ruled, but it was only a three judge panel. This would go to the full appeals court. So it could be a different ruling. It just, it's, sort of bad luck that these groups were trying to collect signatures at this point, Kathy. It is, and that Michigan ruling, I saw that as well, upheld, um, it upheld a similar signature requirement um, that was in, the, and it must've been in the constitution as well. So it'll be interesting to see, but you're right, it was a three judge panel. So we'll have to see what the full bench says, but just put it under, the, under more election litigation. We don't have enough of that. And the, the big thing is the judge, the federal judge did not reduce the number of signatures they had to collect in Michigan. They did reduce the number they had to collect. Oh. And they're looking for that. And, and um, they have to collect at least 455,000 valid signatures, which means you're gonna collect many more because of the, of the failure rate of those signatures. All right, let's well, get to our record comments. Final thoughts for the week. Kathy Kandusky, we'll let you go first. Well, I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting to see what school is going to look like in the fall. And I think what we're going to see is not anything like what we've had this year, but probably students going to school on alternate days and still doing a lot of at-home online schooling. Interesting. Uh, Laura Bischoff, your final thought. You know, I'd like to just uh, point out that a year ago, Ohio or the Dayton area had more than two dozen tornadoes touch down over Memorial Day weekend. Uh, it was 
incredibly devastating for the for the region. And there's still neighborhoods that are really hard to hit. And uh, you know, check out DaytonDailyNews.com for some in-depth coverage this this weekend on what's happened in the past year and what has not. Well, now they're dealing with perhaps dealing with flooding of all the rain we've had over the past uh, week or so. My author record comment uh, this week, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, MORPSI, issued a feasibility study on the Hyperloop. Remember the Hyperloop? That's the vacuum tube is going to take us to Chicago in a half hour. Well, this was a physical feasibility study, and apparently it will be physically feasible to build the Hyperloop from Pittsburgh to Columbus to Chicago. This report was filled with numbers. It's going to take 200, 2 billion car passengers off the road. It's going to take two and a half million tons of carbon dioxide emissions out of the atmosphere, $300 billion in economic benefits. It even had the fare price, $60. That's it to get from Columbus to Chicago. One number did not include how much it would cost to build it. They said it was too complicated to calculate that. Too complicated or too high? That is Columbus on the Record for this week. We urge you to check us out online. We are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. No TikTok for us, not just yet. And of course, you can watch us on demand whenever you want. You can binge us if you'd like during the shutdown at WOSU.org. For our crew here at WOSU and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Please be safe, stay apart, and wear your mask. Have a good week.